Welcome to episode 215 of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast, recorded live on January 29th, 2021. This is a show about Microsoft 365 and Azure from the perspective of IT pros and end users, where we discuss the topic or recent news and how it relates to you. In this episode, we discuss preview features coming to Azure Storage for configuring resource-specific instances, instance access through the service level firewall. After that, it's on to a Logic Apps preview and the new runtime based on Azure Functions. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Back back again. Did you uh buy all your GameStop stock this week? Like are are you rich and leaving us? No. I did make no? like 40 bucks off AMC though. Once it all started <laughs> happening, I quick bought a few shares and sold them right away. Now that Reddit users have figured out they can manipulate the stock market. Oh, what shall we do? How about wow. you? Did you make millions? Uh, no, I, I, I am. I have not made millions, but I, I, I am one hundred percent here for the uh, transfer of wealth and and just kind of having my popcorn and watching from the side, <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not spilling any tears that a couple of hedge funds are <laughs> burning down. <laughs> yeah, it was so. I mean, I could have just watched the AMC stock price and the GameStop stock price go up and down. I just bought a couple shares. I don't know. I bought like five shares or 10. I think I bought 10 shares. More out of the pure entertainment of watching that dollar amount of my AMC stock, I told somebody, it was like, it's like watching a bouncy ball because people <laughs> were buying and selling and the price was fluctuating so much so fast. It was just entertaining to watch. Yeah. Um, uh, Like I said, uh, popcorn uh, all all the way. (laughs) Yes. Um, The other tidbit, did you go sign up to be alerted of your Kensington Studio doc? Have you seen this? No, I haven't. Are, Are you holding out on me? I well, so the the sign up link has been broken for me. I don't know if it's a browser thing. I tried a few different browsers, and I tried signing up a few different times, and I have been unable to register. That being said, I don't know how cheap it is. So we've talked before about the possibility of making an iPad into your computer. Mm-hmm. So this is like a stock for the iPad Pro that charges that it has a charging like wireless charging for your airpods for your phone it's like a little mini imac yeah well and then it gives you all those ports it gives you usb type a type c and hdmi port gigabit ethernet your three and a half millimeter audio sd card reader so you just dock your ipad on this little stand connect all your external peripherals including a monitor via hdmi 2 and you're off and running. Yep. All they'll have to do is... Get Apple to better support external display devices? Well, that and... Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. They're going to fix ex- external <laughs> monitor support and maybe one or two other things along the way. But yes. <laughs> but And it rotates. like You can flip it so you can get portrait mode or vertical mode. or. Yeah, it looks like a little mini iMac. Isn't that cute it is like i wasn't i mean all the ports would be nice i wouldn't use it for me sometimes i would just like a dock very similar to that that charges my ipad and everything that i can just kind of set my ipad like on my dock or desk here if i want to jot a note down or look something up on that quick a minute um so I don't know that given everything this is going to include, that the price point is going to be one that I want to enter in just for a stand for my iPad. But it was a intriguing device. Yeah. Well, if, if you just want like a nice little USB hub uh, for your iPad, I recommend the little hyper ones that just chunk right in on the side and they give you all the same things um, just without the stand. Just without the stand. See, I want the stand more than I want all the ports and 
stuff. But well, uh, you should look at the uh, what are what are they the uh, Vison stands, uh, Vison Vision Voison. Um, uh, uh, well, that really helps me be able to spell it right there with ten different pronunciations. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, you know, sometimes it's a little uh, little rough to get going, but uh, I'll, I'll put a link in uh, the show notes for that one. But that that is that that will be about a, a very similar kind of thing. Uh, throw your iPad in, be able to rotate it in multiple directions. It's a nice uh, aluminum stand. Uh, it doesn't have the dock thing, but it only costs thirty four dollars. So it's a lot it, cheaper than I'm guessing. This is going to be at least two or three hundred. If I had to bet something on this Kensington one, <laughs> I did find it. Viz- oh, so so, so Vi- cheaper cheaper Vison? than Apple's official dock. Voison. 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 B i o z o n. Yes. Uh, so I I have one of those kicking around, um, and I I can absolutely recommend it. Got it. Uh, ad- adjustable angle as well, which is important. Okay. Right? Being able to. Nice. I'll have to check that out. I'll add it to my list because I just spent all my reward points. I finally went. So we had that podcast, I don't know, Thanksgiving time. And we were talking about devices. And you had mentioned the uh, uh, Jabra 510 puck. Yep. So I've been doing training this week, like... 10 to 12 hours a day, four days in a row. (laughs) And my earbuds are comfortable, but they are not that comfortable that by yesterday, my inner ear was sore. And I asked a few other people too. I was like, do you guys use over the head headsets? What does everybody use? And everybody's like, oh, I have the Jabra 510. I have the Jabra 510. I have the Jabra 510. I'm like, okay, fine. Everybody is speaking to me. I should go buy this Jabra 510. (laughs) You're, you're you're getting on the train. It's 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 very freeing, isn't it? Like you well, just you lose the the headphones. I mean, you can keep the headphones if so. you want. Switch to over ears, uh, but yeah, it's yeah, it's, it'll be here today. So all things Amazon has them right now for ninety bucks. Ooh, so ninety bucks, some reward points, some gift cards. It cost me like fourteen dollars to get one. It's like done. I might just buy an extra one to have it in the back then. <laughs> Like, yep, you, go you look know, them up. They're like fifty percent off right now. Yeah, assuming they're still fifty percent off. No, they're they're they it says it's still ninety dollars now. So. All right, and who knows by the time this is released in another five six days? But if it's not, I'm sorry you missed out. You you know you know what? Like even if it's a little bit more money, uh, you can support the podcast by going and and purchasing one through a nice affiliate link. Uh, affiliate we'll link make it at the we'll, bottom. We'll make what, like two cents? Something like that. We can buy, um, I don't know. We can flatten out a penny on a train track. Although technically that's illegal. So no, I've never done that. Right? Because it's destroying money, which is federal property, which is technically illegal. Technically. Well, so that brought up another question. We're going way off the rails here. Aren't all those little things at the zoo then where you flatten out a penny for 50 cents also illegal? Uh, we're, we're not going to get into it, Ben. Okay. Should we get into actual news now? Uh, we can. We, we we can talk about whatever you want. It's your show. <laughs> no, we were talking about what you want today. We both had a link. You go first. You pick which one we're going to start with. And it is not my show. This show would uh, not be what it is without you, Scott. Oh, no, no, no. It's, 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 it's your show. I'm part of the supporting cast. Uh, let's start with um, storage. Uh, Store well technically yeah. these bo- kind of both touch on storage, but there is one that is more storage specific. Uh, sure, uh, it's like you spend all your time in storage recently, Scott. You like talking about storage. Uh, <laughs> if, uh, I, I do spend all my time in storage. Uh, do, do I like talking about it all the time? Uh, no. Sometimes I'd rather talk about uh, Jabra pucks. That 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 would be the uh, the the preferred way to go. Um, all right. So, what's this new feature in storage? Because it looks rather intriguing based on what we were looking at this morning. Uh, yeah. So, uh, a little change to the UI for. Uh, for configuring network rules for your storage accounts. Uh, so one of the things that 
we see a lot of with customers, uh, and I've certainly felt this pain as a customer, and and uh, you know I can understand uh, where they're coming from. Uh, is you create a storage account? Or you have a service that you've spun up that relies on a storage account in the background, uh, which lots of Azure services uh, do, right? You create an uh, HDI cluster, spins up a storage account. You create a, a bunch of different things, create a, a, an Azure function, you get a storage account. Uh, yep. Well, you might want more than uh, one thing to access that storage account. And those things that you want to access the storage account, uh, you, you might want to be really restrictive in what that is. So specifically, you have an instance of a resource that now you want to come over and access that uh, access that storage account, uh, but you want only that instance to uh, only that instance to have access to it. You don't want to uh, have a, a wide open uh, a wide open firewall, and you want to be fairly restrictive in. Uh, what's going to be able to come in and uh, interact with that storage account, whether it's for uh, loading data into it, it could be uh, enumerating over data in there, it could be like a data lake or something like that, uh, whatever it happens to be. Uh, so what's happened in the past is you might go and look at a storage account and go into, say, like the networking blade in the Azure portal, and you make this little flip. You go from allow network access from all networks to selected networks, and all of a sudden uh, the blade changes a and you go, whoa, there's a bunch of options here. And one of your options was kind of a blanket exception. So let's have an exception that says, uh, allow trusted Microsoft uh, services to access this storage account. So there, there's a built-in list of services, uh, in the at least in the case of uh, storage and uh, all, most other resources, all of them should document this as well. Of when you click this checkbox, here's all the things that are going to have access to your storage account. Now, the thing there is, if I say allow access from trusted Microsoft services, all of a sudden that means that it's not just my, uh, say like my SQL server, it's every SQL server that's out there, like uh, specifically like a, a Microsoft.SQL uh, slash server uh, type of resource. Right. So You're that, essentially that, that, opening it up to the entire Microsoft cloud at that point in time. If something sits in yes. the Microsoft yep. cloud, it can access said resource. Yep. Uh, so that, that might not be your ideal uh, I ideal state. You might have just uh, a specific, say, uh, like runtime in ADF or a specific SQL server. Uh, maybe you have a specific uh, Synapse workspace. Uh, could be something like even like, uh, it doesn't have to be data related. It could be like a container registry, right? C container right. registries well, can store I'm their assuming, data. Could you even go down to like the Azure Cloud Shell? Because that has a storage account. Uh, it depends on the type of resource that's coming in. So, so there are some limited uh, resource instance types uh, that are out there. So you do have to be in the uh, in the supported list. Like they are pretty data centric, but the, there okay. is other, other stuff out there. I, I'd encourage folks to go read the documentation. Um, and anywho, what this is is uh, you'll see a new option in there now uh, when you flip over to that uh, selected. Uh, selected networks pane, and you're going to see a section of the blade that's called resource instances. And what you do there is you can specify uh, a, a given set, like one or more of resource instances that are going to have access to that storage account uh, based on their managed identity. So, so that system assigned managed identity uh, when those uh, when those other resources were instantiated. So th that's like, okay, kind of cool. What what can I do with that? Well, you've got a couple of options in here. So say, uh, like, I, I, I want to uh, have a SQL server. So I'll say, what's my resource type? It's Microsoft.SQL slash servers. That's pretty easy. Uh, then I can go and select one or more individual instances. And not just individual instances, I can say um, maybe all the instances in the current subscription. So give me, let all the SQL servers that are in the same subscription as my storage account yep. uh, come in and access this. Uh, let all the SQL servers that are in the same resource group. So I've got that level of granularity. Okay. 
Um, or let everything that's in the current tenant uh, come in. Or let only this SQL server, like this specific name instance, uh, go ahead and come in specifically through the firewall. And then once I've set that up on, on the service level firewall side, then because these are system assigned managed identities that are coming through, yep. I can actually assign those managed identities uh, data access plane permissions within my storage account. Uh, so it doesn't just need to be a management plane kind of thing where I say it can come through the firewall. Once it comes through the firewall, I can actually dictate what it can do with my data. So say in the case of like my SQL server, if I um, put it in the allow list, then it can come through on the other side. And um, I can say, now I'm going to give it uh, just blob data reader access. And now it only has access to uh, read blobs within my storage account. So now it can both traverse my service level firewall uh, and it can enumerate the data within uh, within my storage account, which is uh, super cool and and uh, super nifty. So you could certainly do these th these kinds of things in the past. Like you could you know make the exception and you could let the uh, the resource instance, uh, uh, give it that data plane access. Uh, but now you've just got a, an additional level of granularity in there where you can lock it down even further and you don't potentially have to open things up to, uh, to all Microsoft, uh, services. Uh, you can just open it up to specific instances or specific, uh, resource types. Uh, which I, I think like that that's super powerful kind of stuff. And to have it just be, uh, you know, in, in this case to like onboard to this and get it going, like it, it's literally just going into a couple of, of drop downs inside the Azure portal. Certainly you can manage things through uh, the CLI and, and PowerShell or the REST APIs as well um, on, on the ARM side. But, you know, it, it's just a couple of check boxes now, uh, which is uh, just Awesome and uh, awesome and slick. So uh, that's out there. Uh, recently announced uh, in preview, like earlier this week. Got it. So I don't know where I was going to go with that. I was I was thinking through all this in my head because this works really well too. Like if you have two different resources and one's like writing your data to the storage and the other one is somehow doing reporting and just a read-only access and you can really start locking it down then. Yeah, you, um, you, you could be super granular here. So say uh, say you have a data lake and that yep. data lake is kind of, the, it, it's the... It's the meat, right? It's it's the glue of that whole kind of uh, uh, flow or pipeline. So right. maybe you have uh, data coming in from ADF, like you're copying data from the web or for some, from some other resource. Uh, yep. ADF needs to talk. Uh, Azure Data Factory uh, needs to talk to your data lake. So now you grant that ADF instance and only that instance access to your storage that account through the firewall. Lake. Yep. Um, and then uh, you grant it again, that, that data plane permission as well, based on its system, uh, system assigned managed identity. Uh, now that uh, now ADF can ingest that data for you. It can transform it, do whatever it needs to do. Uh, and then maybe on the <laughs> other side, uh, you're also querying that data uh, with say Synapse. Uh, so uh, by the same token, uh, you, you can have that push mechanism from Azure Data Factory, and then you can also add your Synapse instance to the allow list as well, so that it can come in uh, and do gets against data uh, and uh, enumerate and pull it back however you want it. Uh, uh, so you can start to, you can start to like, uh, n not only keep the uh, it, you know, keep the workflows that you have in place today, but now you can lock those down in more meaningful ways uh, and uh, have the assurance that you are, uh, you know, putting the right restrictions in place. Uh, you have the kind of right governance rules as far as system access uh, comes along. Uh, and, and I think the great thing here is, uh, when it comes to resource instances specifically through the service level firewall, uh, really the only uh, limitation there, the only rule is they have to be in the same tenant 
as your storage account, but they can belong to any other resource group or any other subscription. So say it is that data lake and that data lake is kind of like the shared service, right? It's it's, it's the big one where everybody goes in and, right, and everybody. out of, and you've got a hundred subscriptions or 10 or, you know, even five to whatever your number is, if you have more than one, uh, now it's, now it's possible to, uh, be able to pull those system, uh, system assigned managed identities through and, uh, put them in the allow list at the firewall level. Got it. Yeah. And I was just going to say, even from like that auditing and governance perspective, I can imagine this would be nice if you ever start seeing, if you have it locked down and you start seeing data that isn't clear where it's coming from or how the state is getting in there. If you have it locked down, you know, well, it has to be coming from this one resource because that's the only resource that's allowed access to this storage account. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, well, you'd, you'd have those kinds of things. Uh, th there's a ton of verbose logging that you can turn on within your storage accounts as well and kind of have that data uh, visible inside of Azure Monitor. You can store it in a log analytics workspace, uh, put it in another storage account, event hub, things like that. Uh, diagnostics and and all that, all that. Uh, is, Interesting. Is, is there as well. Yep. That is That sounds way cooler than the one I found last night. Yeah, no, I I think uh, it's well, it's kind of like low hanging fruit. <laughs> you, right, you know, you're like like why didn't you do this before? Well, and, 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 uh, being on the inside now, it's like a ton of work to actually realize <laughs> how all this stuff is uh, uh, kind of wired up and 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 put together on the back end. Uh, but it, it's like super simple when you see it. Like just click a couple check boxes, uh, and it's an empowering feature. So I I like those kinds of things. Yep. And like you said, it is all at the networking level. So on this article, like if you click to go read more about it and get all the information, it takes you into the Azure storage firewalls and virtual network documentation. Correct. Yeah, because because it it is a service level uh, firewall configuration. Yep. So yeah. All right. So, so so the docs are all updated for that. Uh, 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 usual rules apply. It is a uh, public preview feature, um, but uh, I think it's super cool. Which public preview means Ben should go turn it on everywhere that he has in his environment and play Abs with it. A a absolutely, 100%. Because <laughs> that's what Ben that. does. <laughs> All right, so the other one I found that we had to do some looking and digging through to and trying to figure out exactly what was going on with this one was another preview feature. So again, Ben should go turn it on. Everybody else should be very careful with it. Um, logic. So the title of the article is Logic Apps Anywhere. Networking Possibilities with Logic Apps Preview or Logic App Preview. So there is now a new Logic Apps Preview that essentially gives you uh, private endpoints. That was the word I was looking for, right? Yes. <laughs> Private endpoints. It's been a long week. I need some grace this week. Uh, I'll let you allow private endpoints to your logic apps so that you can keep them all within your VNet rather than having these logic apps available for anything. So the first sentence of this article is a little this is what tripped us up. So the first sentence is Logic App Preview enables hosting Logic Apps runtime on top of app service infrastructure and as a result, inherits many platform capabilities that app service offers. In this blog, we go explore some of the networking possibilities and it goes on to explore these network possibilities. And your point, Scott, was that aren't Logic Apps already on top of the app service? Um, and if you go, is it at the bottom? There's a further reading. And it takes you over to the docs. And it is essentially that this new logic app preview resource type, um, it's a redesigned runtime using Azure Functions and is hosted as an extension of the Azure Functions runtime. So it sounds like it actually had more to do with how that was redesigned on top of Azure Functions than necessarily the app service. Uh, yeah, so, so it's a, uh, a redesigned runtime for Logic Apps. Uh, and 
being that it's using the functions runtime, functions runs on top of uh, app service. And that means you get uh, very similar uh, options now as, as far as deployment and compute and, and where you run those kinds of things. So like, do you run it in, um, uh, in an app service plan, like a premium app service plan uh, that has private VNet access, uh, you know, all those kinds of things. Uh, you don't need to potentially, I, I haven't played with this deep enough yet, uh, but potentially maybe you don't need the uh, the old ISE, the, the integration service environment uh, to kind of privatize your, your logic apps and um, uh, bring them a little closer that way. Like this could all just be run on top of uh, native app service now, uh, which uh, is interesting, right? Like, like I, I think that's, uh, that's, that's an, that's a good simplification. Like, you know, if you're familiar with functions and the deployment model there, at least as like an operator, uh, this just makes it easier to go out and potentially be able to deploy logic apps, uh, logic apps as well. Right. And there are, oh, interesting. So now this instance, have, did you actually go in and try to spin one up? Uh, in the portal? In the portal. I got, I got as far as the create button, but I didn't click create. So, oh, so you didn't actually create where you can actually choose if you're going to publish the instance to workflow or to Docker container? No, I did not. You did not get that far. So this is, again, like this is a completely new service. So if you go now into your Azure portal and look for uh, Logic App, you get two. You get the traditional Logic App that you've always done before. And now you get a Logic App Preview is the second one. So this is that Logic App Preview. And the first thing when you go create a new one under the basics is subscription resource group, Logic App name, publish to workflow or to Docker container, and then the region. Uh, I did not mean to click that button. Um, <laughs> I jumped ahead of my hosting. Hosting, you have your storage account. You have a plan type um, where you have a premium and an app service plan, SKU and size, Elastic Premium P1 if you're doing a plan type. If I do Azure Service Plan. So... <sighs> It's been a little while since I've created the traditional logic app. This looks like a lot different options to me. Um, yeah, uh, well, this will look more. This is what it's like when you create a functions when you create a function or an app service uh, to to a certain degree, right? Uh, really, like when you create a function, it's kind of like app service plus storage account for for the storage account dependency. Uh, yep. So you're picking up some of these parts in there as well. So once you get past that basics uh, tab in the create logic app preview blade and you get to things like hosting, uh, now it starts to look a little bit similar, right? Like what's your plan type? Is it premium? Uh, are you going to run on an app service plan? If you're going to run on an app service plan, where's it's hosted? What's the SKU? and size of that app service plan, um, that stuff all comes together pretty quick for you. I need to go cheap. I need to go with free because I am <laughs> cheap when I do these. Uh, Next, review and up, create. Spin up a there we premium, go. premium. So it's out there creating right now. But what this does mean then is as you go start creating these logic apps too, now triggers, webhook triggers are only going to be accessible from within the VNet uh Azure managed API webhook triggers and actions will not work since they need public endpoints for invocations. Uh, monitoring will not have, the monitoring view will not have access to inputs and outputs from actions and triggers if accessed from outside your VNet. So it locks down a lot of that. Uh, even the Visual Studio Code, CLI, I mean, all of this makes sense that now you actually have to be on a machine in your VNet to use any of those with these logic apps because logic apps now just have a private IP address. Again, it's exactly what a private endpoint is supposed to do. It's supposed to restrict all access unless you are inside of your VNet. Um, and it's only incoming. They do have a guide in this blog post on how you can secure your outbound traffic using VNet integration. Um, but by default, it's only going to restrict that incoming access to logic apps. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's more security kind of stuff, right? You, you have more, uh, options that you can choose along the way. So if you're looking for, uh, easier ways to privatize logic apps, like maybe this is a path, uh, path forward for you. Um, and, uh, all the same caveats about preview stuff apply here as well, right? It's a, yes. uh, it's a preview thing, which means it has, uh, it has no SLA or anything like that. And they even include instructions where if it isn't working, go try this. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I would encourage if, if you're interested in this, go read, uh, go read the docs, uh, like the, the overview is decent and explaining what it does, but then there's also two articles in there. There's one for, uh, creating both stateful and stateless workflows through the Azure portal, uh, or from visual studio code. Uh, I'd recommend taking a look maybe at the visual studio code one. Like it's a, uh, it's a fairly meaty article to get you through, uh, but tons of screenshots and things like that. And, uh, it's very well laid out, like what it's doing, uh, along the way, uh, even down to like Docker deployment and things like that. Yep. And they did limit it. So I just, I got mine created and I went into my test logic app and they have also restricted all of those connectors to anything that would actually be allowed given that it has a private endpoint. So when you go add a trigger, for instance, you only have Azure services, you do have an HTTP or a request, some of those other ones that potentially you could be running within your VNet on some other service, whether it's on an app service or within a VM within the VNet, uh, within a SQL server that has a private endpoint. Um, but they do have, they have limited those triggers so you can't inadvertently choose one that just would never even work with a private endpoint. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so so now you got to think a little bit harder about that delineation between connectors and triggers and kind of outbound and inbound flows. Right, and what are you going to do if you all of a sudden create a whole bunch of logic apps in here and then suddenly need connection to some external service? Uh, eh, just stand up a proxy, route them through. You'll be fine. Hey, that's no, There's nothing confusing about that at all, right? <laughs> I can't even find a trigger. I was going to go to actions. I ain't like, I like this listen, the, the, the cloud's all about building blocks, right? So you just go find some more building blocks and you kind of like wire those in and, th and then you're all set. There we go. Built in Azure or built in. So and this makes sense because you do have outbound. So all of your actions after your triggers, you have all the third party ones in there. Because as long as you have outbound, you could go take a trigger and now go right to Adobe Creative Cloud or right to Amazon S3 mm -hmm. or um, Bitly or any of those standard ones because those outbound connections are still allowed. Yep, you got it. There we go. Anything else? That was a very anticlimactic. Okay, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> Uh, no, I, it's, <laughs> it's time to go work. I need to go uh, buy a new battery backup. I, I've got nothing else. It's been a long week and I'm just kind of fried. All right. Well, uh, um, and, and we'll hang up and I'll, I'll send you a link for a, a UPS as well. Uh, is that a rack they, mountable a one? Because I'm a nerd uh, and I have a rack in my closet. <laughs> We're not going to talk about your rack. Um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I haven't, had enough note, for this I haven't had enough coffee for this conversation. All right. Sounds good. We'll go <laughs> with that. Thanks, Scott. Go enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we'll talk to you next week. Unless we <laughs> figure out what the next Reddit stock is, and we both become millionaires and run off to the Bahamas or something. I don't know. Mm, yep, yep. Uh, we probably have better luck of making our money that way than off, or off of affiliate links. So uh, we, maybe we should rethink our stance. Unless we get a couple million people to suddenly listen to this episode and go buy the Jabra 510. <laughs> that will cause a run on them. There we go. <laughs> All right. We'll talk to you later, Scott. All right. Thanks, Ben.